evening and welcome to After Hours. Joining us this evening is David Suzuki. And as many of you may know, he is a um, controversial scientist and a television host and has done many other things. And welcome to the show. Recently, uh, you've been talking about uh, the next 15 years and you're saying that what we need is a change in our fundamental attitudes towards the environment. And I guess I wonder if it uh, really has to do with our attitudes and whether it's our basic living styles. Can we expect ourselves and our communities and people to change the way they live, to make those kinds of Well, what you're changes? asking me is, it seems to me, is there any hope? I feel if there, if, if my answer to that question was no, I wouldn't even be here. Why would he, I even bother with anything? If you say there is, we can't change anybody, then you might as well go out and murder, rape, steal. It doesn't make any difference. Of course I have to believe that we can change. I, I have to because I have young children. I have a major investment into the future. And I don't want, I don't want to, uh, to, to feel at this point that there's nothing I can do to ensure that something is left for them. But I also look to the fact that enormous changes have taken place in South Africa in the last five years, have taken place in, in Germany, have taken place in the Soviet Union. These were unpredictable five or 10 years ago. Massive changes. I look to Canada itself. You know, 20 years ago, Canadians used to be compared with 30 or 60 year old Swedes. We were in terrible shape. The average Canadian was in worse shape than a 60 year old Swede. Today, you never hear that. Why? We've suddenly changed. If you think of the, the person in Canada today who smokes, I mean, they are virtual pariahs in our country. That's happened with enormous speed. So I, I think that people are capable of, of change and, on a, a massive scale. And I think that each of us that's working for that is like a grain of sand. You just keep adding on, and sooner or later, there can be a major shift. If you're talking, well, what can we do? We're facing, you know, transnationals. We're facing a government that is talking about global free trade, talking about NAFTA agreements and so on. Get rid of the government. Free trade is destruction of the planet. We are giving over the earth to the multinationals. And when you lose control over your own place where you live to people whose head offices are in Tokyo or Auckland or in Toronto, they don't care about communities. They don't care about long-term sustainability. So we have to get control back. So I would say the first thing you do is change your government. This government did not have a mandate to invoke free trade. It was elected with a very small minority. Two out of every three Canadians voted against free trade. And it just happened that we have an electoral system where we have a minority, go uh, a government with a minority of the electorate. Get rid of the government. We have to revoke free trade. But my, my biggest recommendation to individuals is if you care about where you live in your community, buy local. Buy and support the people from the community you come from. I spend a lot of time in Toronto. You go into a restaurant in Toronto, chances are if you buy lamb to eat, it came from New Zealand. The chances are you know, that you have, uh, e even in the summer during the best growing season, the peaches, the lettuce, the tomatoes will all come from California or Florida. Buy local for heaven's sake if you want to support an economy that is locally based. That's number one. You would mentioned food production, and our farmers are disappearing, the fish have uh, disappeared on the East Coast. And do you think we're going to see a time, do you think, I could see in the future where food production is not growing food, but it's done in labs and it's uh, made food uh, for the elite. What do you think our food production and what we're doing with it says about us as a species and us as a country? Well, I don't ever see, I don't ever see food not being of the earth. I just think the idea that we'll grow cells in culture and large, uh, have large tanks to grow our fish, and uh, I think that will be, uh, continue to be a very small percentage of the world's food production. Basically, we are still dependent on the earth itself for the food that we're getting. And the fact is that we in Canada are not obtaining our food in a way that makes any sense at all. We are literally mining the organic material from the soil that took hundreds and thousands of years to accumulate. 
we are mining it out of the soil in a matter of decades. The uh, Senator Sparrow's report that came out on, on soil a few years ago showed that uh, we have maybe 40 years of organic material left in the prairies, this vast area that we've called the breadbasket of Canada. You just have to drive from uh, Sask Saskatoon up to North Battleford in Saskatchewan, as I have done, and you can see what, what are called leopard spots. Everywhere there's a little bump or hill. You'll see the color is white. I mean, all of the, the organic material has been leached out of there, and you'll see these spots where you don't have organic material left. We have been pumping material nitrates and things into the soil as if somehow we are uh, able to manage our, our products. And, and it's crazy because we're not. Um, we're not in any way managing the rich soils that were the legacy of, of Canadians who first came to this country. Recently, now, I, I, let me just say that this, you know, we have to become much more self-sufficient in terms of the food that we grow. And it doesn't make any sense to me that we as a species can afford, as we do in Vancouver, to go to the Granville Mar Market 12 months a year and buy fresh fruits and vegetables 12 months a year that are shipped by plane from Australia, from South America, from, from Europe. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, we are living very, very high on the ecological food chain, and it simply cannot continue. Uh, we, are, we, we keep pointing to the third world and saying, well, it's their problem. You know, they're breeding like dogs or flies, and they're having all these children. It is true, they have a very severe problem with population. But the average Canadian consumes 16 to 20 times as much as the average Chinese or Indian in India we consume up to 50 times as much as the people in the poorest countries like Bangladesh or Somalia. So you have to multiply the Canadian population by anywhere from 20 to 50 to get an idea of the true ecological impact of our, of our high style of living on the planet. And then you'll see that the, that the population problem is not in the poor countries, it's here. I know my experience um, several years ago for the first time in a long time I went uh, camping out, not in sort of a campground, but out in the woods. And you know, I take my food with me and whatever. And it was such a profound thing to feel that, say my food somehow went down the river. Mm. I didn't know, I didn't have a clue of what to eat. I didn't, I couldn't yes. survive, you know killing an animal, that would take a lot for mm -hmm. me to do. And it was a very profound feeling. We've got very removed from really the fundamental things. I'm, this is a very trivial thing, but the other day, you know, in our house, like things get worse and worse over a period of time, and it happened to be the sink. Every time I would brush my teeth and spit into the sink, it would take two minutes before it finally went down the drain. This went on for weeks. <laughs> I don't know if your audience would, would identify with this, but this... And so finally one day I came up with a monkey wrench and started pulling the, the sink apart. My wife said, David, you've never done this before. And I said, yeah, but we are so helpless. And I took it all apart and cleaned it out. And I said, look, we've got to start learning how do you make bread. We've got to start learning how you sew patches on, on socks. And we'd better get back to some very, very fundamental things. We think that everything is in book learning and making sure our kids know how to use computers and all of that stuff. But we become helpless when it comes down to the real things that matter, like you're talking about. We're raising a really disconnected group of children. You know, we have a, a wonderful place on Quadra Island. And some American relatives of ours came up from Cleveland. They were teenagers and stayed at the cottage. And the first night, we sat out on the porch and these two teenage kids, very bright, going to university, all that stuff, looked up and went, what's that? They had never seen the Milky Way in their lives. Patrice, kids growing up in cities all over the world have never seen the Milky Way, you know? Mm -hmm. And we went out the next day and we were walking up through this valley and they, they were asked, did you bring anything to drink? I said, there's a creek right there. What? You can't drink out of a creek. What kind of a world is this where our kids take it for granted that they look up in the sky and see a few hundred stars and that you don't drink the water that runs in a wild creek? It grieves me 
it really grieves me because it tells you right there that in my lifetime, the things that I took for granted are not there for these kids. And yet people deny that there's any problem. And they say people like us are scaremongers, you know, that we're against progress. Um, the evidence is right there. Recently, Paul George from the Western Canadian Wilderness Committee walked out of the core talks, which is the government and industry and environmentalists oh, really? trying to work things that? out. I think that was last week, just recently. One of his comments I heard was that he said it was all, you know, very friendly and huggy and kissy, and meanwhile, everything, you know, is being logged. I guess I want your comment in response to that. Well, I think the problem that we face is this sense of difference in, in the seriousness of the problem. There's been a great deal of effort on the part of governments at both the federal and the provincial level to set up these round tables and we've got this catchphrase called sustainable development that came out of the Brundtland Commission uh, in 1987. Well, sustainable development to me is a joke because sustainability means living in a way that can be done forever. Development the way our society sees it is associated with growth. Now you can't have sustainable growth forever in a finite world. So people have jumped on sustainable development as if they can have their cake and eat it that we can live forever with growth. And so, um, in large part, these roundtables on sustainable development, which have attempted to bring a broad coalition of people from industry, from the logging community, fishing, and so on, have been an attempt to work out a strategy of maintaining, of having sustainable development without ever coming to grips with the fact that if we truly want a sustainable society, there has to be a fundamental difference in the way we do everything. And unfortunately, on all of these uh, committees, and, and the core process looks the same, there are very few people on those committees who truly understand the fundamental attitudinal and philosophical change that's needed. And so environmentalists are left being one minority group among a large number of people who perceive their own vested interests as hunting, fishing, logging, and all of the other same old things, those who are trying to say, sorry folks, there's got to be a different assessment, are a minority and get, get swamped. And so this whole attempt at achieving consensus, I think, is wrong because we haven't got a consensus on what is the underlying issue. You know, I heard uh, an announcement on CBC Radio the other day that said that the um, forest industry in Williams Lake was, a, was saying, the business people in our town better get on board because if they don't get to, they, if they don't come out and support the long-term survivability of the forest industry, we're in deep trouble. And I thought, but that's the whole problem, you see. The basic problem for everyone in Williams Lake is to preserve the forest. And when you preserve the forest, the forest industry, business, all of those other things will follow. But over and over again, we are fighting a battle over a logger's job as opposed to somebody's park. And it's as if these two values are always at conflict and the choice is either you log it or you save it and lose the jobs. It's the wrong way to do it. No environmentalist that I know of is against logging. And I have encountered many loggers who've wanted to, to break my head in and I've said to them, look, all I care about, I'm not against logging. I love to work in wood. I was a carpenter for eight years. All I care about is that your children and grandchildren will be able to log forests as rich as the ones that you are presently logging. And you know, you know what they say? To a man, their response is, no bloody way. There aren't going to be any trees left for my grandchildren. So I say, well, what the hell are we fighting about then? You call us your enemy. We're fighting for the same thing. We want to assure rich forests in this province forever so that there will be loggers and there will be native people that will be able to use them as they always have. And there will be uh, campers and canoeists and everybody. But let's get on with saving the forest so that we can all do that rather than pit your job against this park. It's crazy. And you know, the greatest disappointment to a lot of environmentalists has been that the current government has 
really seem no different from the one it's replaced. It has perpetuated the same battles, except that now the, the, uh, there is a much greater representation from the union in terms of the priorities of, this, of the NDP government, because the IWA is a, a strong supporter of, uh, of the NDP. But I don't see any change in fundamental attitude towards those forests and, and what they represent. And I know there are a lot of disappointed people who, who fought for the NDP government. What I can't understand is the sort of similar to what you're saying is like the corporate mind and the corporate, because can't they see that if they cut down all the forests, they are not going to survive? Or will they always survive in paperwork? Well, I, th there are two answers to that. One is these forest companies have never had to worry about the second generation of trees. They talk about sustainable forestry. They don't even know what a sustainable forestry is. They're brand new companies. They are, they are liquidating the old growth forest on which they have depended. 95% or more of the trees being cut in British Columbia are still old growth trees. They have no idea what the fall down is going to be when they come to that second growth. So these companies are, don't know what it means to be a company that has a 500 year logging plan. They're interested, and I've had Adam Zimmerman, who is the president of Naranda Mines, I don't know what he is now, but he said, he said a number of things to me. One thing he said is, well, a tree doesn't have any value till it's cut down. Well, of course, economically speaking, he's absolutely right. You know, we only think of it in terms of lumber. We don't think of its, its use in preventing erosion and flooding or being a climate modulator, or providing habitat for, for animals and, and plants. We just think of it in economic terms. You cut it down and you make money as pulp or, or lumber. He also said, look, you don't have an argument with me. My job is to maximize profit for my shareholders, and I do that very well. If you don't like the way I do it, you've got an argument with government. Everything I do is legal. Again, he's absolutely right. So, but if you have maximization of the shareholder as your primary um, priority, then issues like sustainability of communities, sustainability of ecosystems, come very f much further down in the, in the priorities. You know, I had Peter, Benchley, uh, Peter Bentley, who is the president of Canfor, say to me, I've, I'm, an e I'm an environmentalist like you. He said, I've got seven children. Envi I'm an environmentalist like you. And I care about the environment. But his company, you know, at Wood Fiber and, and up on Sea Shelf there, they have, they have created a, a shellfish industry that's extinct in those areas because they've been shut down through the pollution. So the words come out, and the sentiment seems to be there, but the action doesn't. And it's because I think the fundamental priority is you've got to make money. And we don't have anything in that accounting system that demands that there be ecological responsibility. You know, even, even uh, what was the company at uh, Love Canal? All they did was go belly up and declare themselves bankrupt. There's no liability for what you've done to that community. What about, what part, um, and I know environmentalists get a lot of criticism, but what part, because we function as a society so much as institutions, they get built and grow, yeah. has environmental organizations, especially large ones, become part of a system of not change and fundamental? Well, I think, that's a, I think that's a very good question. And, and from my standpoint, one of the problems is that the minute you get into the economic system, which I say is a corrupt system to begin with, you're really you're, you're caught in a real dilemma. And for many organizations, they have accepted money from government. They accept money from corporations. And the minute you do that, it changes your you can't operate the same way. And I think to Greenpeace's credit, Greenpeace has always, you know, they haven't had a charitable number so that you can't get a write-off from them. They haven't taken government money. So that they have had the freedom then to remain as true to their, their goals as they, they could be. Now the problem with Greenpeace, of course, is that it's become incredibly bureaucratized and that mm -hmm. takes a lot of money so that you end up spending much more of your money on the people, your staff, and trying to get more money. And I, that's a very tough one to, to avoid. 
But Greenpeace, I think, has had a very good track record. Western Canada Wilderness has had a, a good track record. But there are many organizations that take a lot of money from government, and they become, to my mind, far less effective uh, by doing that. One person that, that um, some people, I would say a lot of people, we've heard about and has uh, had a lot of controversy around him and his society is Paul Watson, the Sea Shepherd Society. Do you think we need more action? If we didn't have the Paul Watsons of the world, we wouldn't be nearly as where we are now. It would be terrible if all of society went and said, Paul Watson's great and let's go with, with Paul's actions and let's ram all the ships and do all of the, I mean, Paul is a swashbuckling guy uh, who's kind of from the Douglas Fairbanks time. But thank God there are the Paul Watsons around because you need the extreme people on the outer edge in order to draw the, where society is. If you didn't have women carrying out the extreme pro protests, although many people made fun of them burning bras and all of that, if you didn't have those people, society wouldn't come nearly as far as fast as it has. So that you always have to say that, that you need people like that. Paul has never threatened uh, human life, as far as I know. Um, he's been willing to sink ships and, and things like that uh, and put his body on the line. He's not, you know, he's not armed, and he's certainly been ready to go to jail. And, uh, you know, it's a good thing he's there. I can't do that, but... Do you think part of what's going on in terms of, well, that's the whole planet and decision-making and an institution is the male dominance of decision-making? I, I, think, I think that it's uh, a large part of the, the problem that we face. And, uh, you know, I have an, a foundation, the Suzuki Foundation, which is to raise money. It's a charitable foundation. And we are funding an institute for a sustainable future. And one of the, the absolute uh, agreements that we had was that the executive director will be a woman and that the board will be a minimum of 50% women. Because I believe that critical to the change is going to be the perspective that women have been left with. Males traditionally have gone on with a very short-sighted uh, perspective of power or profit. And they are, live in a very competitive world in which exploitation is a part of their activity. Women, traditionally having been left out of the power structure, have had a, a very different perspective, which has to do with family, with sharing, cooperation, community, long term. And those are the, the values that we desperately need now, I think. So ecofeminism, I think, is an absolutely critical part of this change that we're going to need. And it's not an accident that Many, many of the leaders in the environmental movement across this country and in other parts of the world are women. Part of it is because they do things for nothing. I think of my wife who's got a PhD and taught at Harvard for five years and gave that up to work for three years now for no pay because she really believes in the issue. There, women do that. But as well, I think women have much more to offer in the environmental movement. I'm going to come back. We discussed it a bit earlier. And you talked about hope, but I guess for people watching, and I guess, I just wonder, because people are so, because of the problems of poverty, because of so many women having children and being single, um, how do you begin to change that process? What to you is the... Well, to me, the first thing we have to, there are a couple of things you have to realize. One is that we are facing a crisis that is real. You can't deny it. So that that must overwhelm us. Look, we are, first of all, animals. And as animals, we have an absolute requirement for clean air, clean water, and clean food that comes from the soil. Every bit of our food was once living, a plant or animal. That ties us to the earth as biological beings. If we are intelligent biological beings who care about our children's future, then we must change our ways to protect air, water, soil, and biological creatures. That's an absolute requirement. So what is the proof that, the, that we're endangering it? Well, my uh, answer to that is talk to anybody who's lived in this area for 70 years or more. Ask them when they were children, what was this area like? 
and then compare what they, they knew as children with what we have today and say, is that progress? Can we continue to do it? If you look at the changes, I mean, and I do this, my father's 84, and he tells me about what Vancouver was like when he was a kid. It makes you weep. When I came back to Vancouver to live permanently in 1963, every year there was a massive Vancouver Sun Derby out at Horseshoe Bay. And hundreds of thousands of dollars in prizes were given to the biggest salmon. There hasn't been a Vancouver Sun Derby now for years. Why? There are no, no salmon. I used to go to Squamish and jig herring 25 years ago. You could fill a bucket in five minutes with herring. There aren't any herring there now. We used to go down to the beach here at, at Kitts or down to Stanley Park and catch crab and eat them. You wouldn't dare touch a crab that comes out of there now. Can't we see it's happening right before our eyes? What do we need to convince us that we are in a severe crisis? I have been sitting in my house in Kitts every day for the last week on beautiful sunny days looking out at that cloud that I know is coming from wood fiber right across West Vancouver there. And you just have to look on, you know, on successive sunny days and see the air turn from clear to yellow to brown. What the hell is going on? Do we think that we can continue to do this? And we talk about the population of Vancouver doubling over the next two decades. What's going on? Do we think that we can maintain that? Convince yourself it's real. Then ask yourselves, are we so happy? Is life good? If you look at a city, what's so hot about a city? You have alienation, violence. You have a lot of loneliness, drug abuse. You have, is this the way that we want to live? Well, if we are embarked on a very destructive ecological direction, and if cities ain't so hot, maybe there are ways to develop a different way of living that will provide us with much greater satisfaction and quality of life and be far less intrusive on the environment than there are. What we have to learn to do is to live within the ecological caring capacity of our place where we live. We have to learn to live in ways that don't put out into air, water, and soil the poisons that are going to come back into our systems. And we can begin to restructure ourselves along communities. What does that mean? It means it is unacceptable to live an hour and a half from where you work. It doesn't make any sense to me at all that we think it's tolerable to sit in a car for an hour and a half and drive to work and drive for an hour and a half back when we could live near where we work and have three hours of quality time with our children or whatever we want to do. But we've got to start realizing it, we're living in an insane way. And we have to now begin to restructure the way that we live along the lines of communities that give us support networks that will allow single parents to have a greater uh, safety net out there. That they won't have to go to government because they'll have neighbors and friends and a network of people that will come to their aid and offer them what they need. And I think that we've got to start thinking along those lines. I don't have all the answers. The foundation I've formed is trying to raise the money to fund an institute that will get those answers. I don't think we need any original research. The answers are out there. We've got to just pull them together. We want to form a manual of how you go about getting communities back to mean something, getting control of your community, and having a higher quality of life. I think that we have come to believe that material wealth P possessing things is equated with progress and a good life. And yet the more that we have, there is still an emptiness that stays inside. And we think that that emptiness has to be filled with more things, so that if we don't have enough money to buy more things, and if we don't have greater variety, somehow we feel that that emptiness won't be filled. And yet we know that we're trying to stuff that hole and we feel emptier and emptier. You know, when I grew up as a kid in the 1940s, and I look at what we had compared to my children, it's staggering. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't have computers, we didn't have CDs, there wasn't even hi-fi, you know, stereos back then. We didn't have videotapes, we didn't have jet planes or computers, I mean, or uh, nuclear power. We didn't have any of those things. But I lived a rich, full life. All these things aren't making us happier. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner I think we can seriously get on with trying to develop a quality of life that makes more sense, that is more in tune with living in harmony with the earth.
Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us.